My name is Maria De Palma, and I'm here from the Learning Disabilities Research Program at the Hospital for Sick Children, and we, we are in Toronto, Canada. And I'm uh, very fortunate to be here with Dr. Uma Kulkarni from the Morris uh, Foundation in Pune, India. We've been collaborating with them since 2006. And today what we want... Or, Sorry, 2016, but it seems like a longer time. Um, and today we want to share a uh, pilot project that we've been collaborating with AMF on for the last two years. Uh, this is a basically a pilot project where we have um, taken our Empower Reading program, which is a program that we've developed based on research over the last 35 years, and we've brought the program uh, to uh, their their resource center in Pune, India. And we would like to share the narrative of this partnership and, uh, and the results that we've obtained to date. And I hope, is it, can you hear us all clearly? You can hear me clearly? Okay, great. And this kind of, uh, international collaboration, it explores the potential to develop literacy skills of children with reading difficulties in low and income uh, low and middle income countries where English is a language of instruction and to improve the skills of teachers in a country where professional development practices are considered substandard we hope to realize a shared goal to advance knowledge and practices about literacy and reading disabilities globally so Specifically, we will, uh, I'll, I'll just give you a brief overview of literacy rates and uh, standards in India, prevalence of the definition of learning disabilities in India, uh, and remediation practices to date, a brief overview of the Empower Reading program that we've developed at Sick Kids. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit about, or Dr. Kulkarni will tell you a little bit about the Morris Foundation. And then we'll give you a narrative of our partnership and what we've seen. And as well, we'll, we'll end with, well, what are some continued challenges and what do we hope, how do we hope to overcome some of those challenges? So if we look at literacy standards in India, India has one of the highest concentrations of illiteracy among young and adult, youth and adults, with over 280 million adults and 40 million youth reported to be illiterate. And these are 2011 statistics. More than 8 million Indian children and young adolescents are out of school. So the rates are very high. Now, despite those rates, they are improving. So if we compare 2001 versus 2011 statistics, we do see a greater number of, uh, of children um, and adults acquiring literacy skills. And in fact, what's lovely to see is the gap between male and female is decreasing as more and more females acquiring uh, literacy skills, both in rural and um, urban areas, although clearly still a higher percentage of rural uh, children and adults have illiteracy issues. In terms of learning disabilities specifically in India, the, you know, as I looked at different uh, journal articles, the prevalence of LD in India vary depending on what you read, anywhere from 1.6% to 15%. And I think a lot of that has to do with the diverging definitions of learning disabilities that exist. Also, the plurality of the Indian society. Uh, socioeconomic status, regions, school attendance, social cultural issues, uh, a wide variety of assessment practices, regional differences in knowledge about screening uh, issues, screening tools for teachers. And then of course there's the bilingualism issue and multilingual issue throughout the country. You have 18 standard languages and then many, many more dialects. And there are limited monitoring practices. So what makes the understanding of learning disabilities and practices for it somewhat limited and hard to ascertain. In terms of remediation practices in India, they are considered at this point still somewhat inadequate and in some places non-existent. There still is limited knowledge about literacy generally and learning disabilities and reading disabilities particularly. Limited sensitivity to learning disabilities by parents and teachers. There's issues regarding overcrowded classrooms and paucity of school infrastructures and additional resources to support remediation. 
Now, hopefully, things will gradually improve. In 2006, learning disabilities were added to the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act. So we're hoping to see a change uh, with greater understanding of learning disabilities, specific learning disabilities as, as we talk about reading disabilities today, and practices for these children. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about where I come from and what we've been doing at the Hospital for Sick Children. So I work with a team that's led by Dr. Maureen Lovett at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And this program has been looking at and trying to understand reading disabilities and what are the underlying core deficits of reading disabilities. And over the last 35 years, we've been developing, based on, on uh, rigorous research, we've been devel developing intervention programs for children and adolescents with significant reading disabilities. And we've learned a lot over these last 35 years. I'll show you some various slides that have led to what we call now our key program, the Empower Reading Program. It's important to note this was based on very early research more than 20 years ago that we conducted. And this research really shows how it was so important at that point we realized when you are providing intervention programming for children with reading disabilities, you must include both phonological training and strategy-based training because they are two of the key core deficits that we see in children and adolescents with reading disabilities, with dyslexia. And we learned that, as you can see, the green line and the, um, the orange line represent kids who receive just the phonological training or just the strategy-based training, whereas the blue line represents the children who got both. And the gains were superior. And this was a very important study. You know, it, it told us, well, we got superior outcomes, faster learning when both phonological and strategy-based interventions are combined. And our gains were generalized to a variety of standardized tests that looked at reading and reading-related um, skills. And from this uh, came the Empower Reading program. Some some other um, interesting things that we looked at, and I think they're particularly relevant as, you know, just even listening to the earlier talk today on bilingualism. Toronto's a very multicultural city. And so we also looked at, well, do children of different language backgrounds make equivalent games? So we compared students who were English language learners. So these were children whose first language younger than three was something other than English and we compared them to children who were English first language and it was about a 45 percent 55 percent split and then we of course had our control condition those were students who had similar profiles they had reading difficulties but were getting whatever the school was teaching in terms of special education and what you're seeing is between the ELL and the EFL lines the blue and the green there's no difference so the English language learners equally benefited from the program. In the next slide, we also looked at socioeconomic status, children who were low socioeconomic status versus medium to high. Again, those low SES kids, they benefited equally to the middle to high SES kids, which is a really important variable for us to look at. Now, in terms of our evolution, and outreach of the Empower Reading program. So our program always has started in research. We develop our programs, we test them out, we take the best components of our program, and from that we've developed Empower Reading, which I'll quickly describe for you. Currently, the Empower Reading program is used um, in many, many schools right across Canada. Uh, but as well, we are implementing the program in underserviced remote communities in Canada. We have many of them. And now we are uh, enjoying this, this partnership where we are trying to bring our program to low-income, middle-income countries on a global level. And of course, there's a lot for us to learn from these collaborations. So you can see since 2006 when we first rolled out the Empower Reading program, we have seen over 31,000 students receive the program. And our program also incorporates a professional development component, which I will describe, and we've trained more than 2,200 teachers. 
So what, it, what are the goals of Empower Reading? It's a multi-component intervention program. And it teaches struggling readers effective strategies. These strategies are for decoding, spelling, comprehension. It allows students to experience success in reading and confidence in their skills. It helps students become independent because we are equipping them with multiple strategies. And we want the kids to be active reader, active readers, whether they're reading for academia or they're reading for pleasure. We have a variety of programs um, depending on the age level of the students and with each of the programs we have a professional development component. You know, we do believe that it, reading is a very complex thing, but at the end of the day we have our decoding and spelling program which will, will be the focus of my talk. If the children can't get the word off the page as we say, they're not going to be able to comprehend. So what are the key instructional features of our Empower Reading program? And these instructional features that we incorporate in the program are, are um, instructional features that are recognized by researchers generally when we talk about intervention programming for RD type students. So we provide a lot of teacher modeling for the children because the teacher is the expert. Gradually the, the students become more independent. Uh, there's mass practice and cumulative review of the content that we teach the children. And that's critical because a lot of the children, for example, have processing issues, memory issues. So that mass practice is critical for them. There is a lot of pre-skill training that we provide for the students. We don't assume that they have the necessary prerequisite skills to be able to provide or to be able to apply each of the strategies. A really important component of our program is that it's very metacognitive. And what I mean by that is we want the children to really understand each of the strategies that we're teaching them. We want them to be able to understand when to use them, how to use them, why they're using them. And so what we provide is what we call a self-talk or a strategy dialogue training. And you'll see as I'm modeling the different strategies how it really reflects that they understand what, they, what it is that they're doing. We also provide explicit teaching of self-monitoring and strategy evaluation skills. These children are not very good at checking what they're doing, evaluating what they're doing. They do something and they move on. But we want them to reflect on what they're doing and if something's not working, then to try another strategy. And then ultimately, we also want to work on attributional retraining. As we know, a lot of students with reading difficulties have very low self-esteem, very poor motivation, very skewed attributions. And we have collaborated with a researcher, Dr. Jan Freiders, also in Canada. And he looked at these uh, issues, motivation, attributions, and they improved as the students were improving in the program. So these are important things to work on as well. Now, what do we teach in Empower Reading? We teach five word identification strategies and spelling strategies. And we start with our sounding out strategy and we work through to the spy strategy. The, the main program that they're using in India is 110 lessons and we recommend that it's taught an hour a day, five days a week, that's our recommendation. And it's very scaffolded, so you're building skills upon skills. So we start with our sounding out strategy. And sounding out is a skill that we often hear about. It's something when the kids come to us, they say, oh yeah, well, when I don't know a word, I'm going to sound out the word. OK, great. But it's really important in order to be able to sound out effectively, you have to have the necessary prerequisite skills. So the dialogue we teach the children to sound out words is, well, first I'll know the sounds. First sound, mmm. Next sound, ah. Next sound, mmm. Next, I'm going to blend the sounds slowly without stopping. Mmm, man. Yeah, y'all learn to be singers. And we say you need to blend it because when you blend it, you can hear the word. And last, I'll read the word, man. I use the sounding out strategy and I read the word man. And that's the dialogue we're actually teaching the students. But in order to be able to use that strategy successfully, we have to work on all of the sub skills. We have to work on their sounds. We have to work on their blending skills. We have to work on their segmenting skills. And we do that both at the oral level as well as in print so that we're working on both phonemic awareness as well as phonological processing. 
And by doing that, we're also directly trying to address those phonological deficits that we see in children with reading disabilities. Our second strategy is the rhyming strategy. So the sounding out strategy the students are receiving throughout the 110 lessons. But then we fold in the next strategy called the rhyming strategy. So rather than looking at uh, words at the phoneme level, now we're looking at words in slightly larger chunks, what we call spelling patterns or rhymes. And so what we do in this strategy is we teach the students 120 of the most common spelling patterns in the English language. So for example, we have the spelling pattern AB. And what we do is we teach the students each of these spelling patterns via a keyword. It's just an anchor word to help them remember that spelling pattern. Well, what's so great about knowing the spelling pattern AB? Well, it exists in so many other words. If we think about word families, right? Word families share spelling patterns. Oh, and they also happen to rhyme. So that's why we call it the rhyming strategy. So for example, we teach the students the keyword and. What's the spelling pattern in and? It happens to be A-N-D. Well, if I know and, I can read so many other words like band, grand, and I can even read sandpit because there's two spelling patterns in that word. So. How do I use the rhyming strategy? So this is the dialogue that we teach the students in the rhyming strategy. Well, first, I'll check mark the vowel because the vowels help me spot spelling patterns. So I'll check mark the vowel A. Then I'll underline the spelling pattern A-C-E. And I know that spelling pattern because my teachers taught me the key word with that spelling pattern. It happens to be place. And I know words with the same spelling pattern rhyme. So if I know place, then I know space. I use the rhyming strategy and I read the word space. So here's now another way to tackle words that I don't know. And by the way, the students are not just practicing using these strategies on isolated words. They're also practicing using these stra strategies um, in connected text. Our third strategy is the peeling off strategy which we introduce to the students about halfway through the program. And here we directly teach the students prefixes and suffixes, how to say them, and then how to segment them from longer words. And it's a great strategy. It enables students to read, finally, these rich, long, multisyllabic words with success. So if we have a word like this, and by the way, by this point, you're not using all of these different strategies in isolation. You're using them together. And we're teaching the students to think about, well, what makes sense to use will depend on the word. You look for clues in that word. And that's the rich metacognitive piece of the program. So for example, in this word, well, I'm first going to use my peeling off strategy because I see some prefixes and suffixes that I recognize. So I'll peel off pro at the beginning of the word. Oh, and I see the suffix if, and I see the suffix li at the end of the word. And now I'm just left with this small root. What strategy can I figure out, can I use for the root? Rhyming, yes, I can use rhyming because I see the spelling pattern es. And if I know guess, then I know, or if I know yes, then I know grass. Could I also sound out that root? Of course I can. I know the sounds, grass, grass. And now I'll put the word together progressively. I use the peeling off and rhyming strategy, and I read the word progressively. Our fourth strategy is called vowel alert. What is the hardest part of the English language? the vowels. Why? Because they make more than one sound. Definitely vowels confuse students more than anything. So in our sounding out strategy, we teach the students the different sounds. We teach them, for example, that A makes two sounds. A as an at and A as an eight. But just because the students have that knowledge, it doesn't mean that they automatically know, well, when I come to a word, I need to be flexible and try both those sounds. They don't automatically do it. So what this strategy does is it tells them, hey, you need to be alert when you come to the vowels because they make more than one sound. And you need to try both those sounds to give you a word, to see which one gives you a word you know. So we introduce the vowel alert strategy with the single vowels and Y, but then we extend this concept of being flexible to C and G to uh, vowel combinations E, A, O, W, O, O, I, E, to what we call our L-controlled vowels, and then to C, H, and G, H. 
So now when I come to a word like this, okay, so first, I think I'm going to use the peeling off strategy because I see suffixes I recognize. So I'll peel off er at the end of the word and e at the end of the word. Now I see that vowel combination ea, and it makes three sounds. Huh. I'm going to have to try all three sounds. Be flexible. I'm going to try the one that's most common, e as in bead. Leath leathery. No, that's not a word I know. Next, I'm going to try e eh as in head. Leath leathery. Yes, that is a word I know. But I'm just going to check my third sound, a eh as in great. Lathe leathery. No, the word is leathery. I used the vowel alert strategy and the peeling off strategy, and I read the word leathery. Our final strategy is called spy. It basically is teaching children to look for small words in big words. Uh, now, I talked earlier about our program also being very metacognitive. And so we do teach the students, again, this self-talk to help them use the strategies. We, we want them to have a very conscious awareness of the, of the strategies. We want them to understand each of the strategies. They can name them. They can tell you when to use them, how to use them, why they're using them. Because this really helps them to be multi-strategic. And so we teach them something called game plan once they have three strategies to help them decide, okay, well, what am I going to choose? Well, I'm going to choose my strategy depending on what I see. What clues do I see in the word? Then I use my strategies. I describe what it is that I'm doing. Then I check. Are my strategies working? Do I score? Is it a word I know? And if I don't, what do I do? I re-choose another strategy. So for example, in connected text, weeding the garden is, mm, I don't know that word, blank work. Well, I see that word. My game plan first is to choose the peeling off strategy because I see a suffix that I recognize. So now I'll use it. I'll peel off, oops, I'll peel off ing at the end of the word. And yes, that's one of my endings. Now I'm going to use the rhyming strategy for the beginning part because I see a spelling pattern I recognize. And it's beautiful. Your kids are actually saying and doing all of this. So I check mark the vowel A. I underline the spelling pattern A, C, K. The keyword is pack. If I know pack, I know back. OK, now I have one part left. And I see that vowel combination E, A. And I know it makes three sounds. So what strategy am I going to use? vowel alert. And so then the students would go through trying the three different sounds to ultimately figure out the word backbreaking. Now I'll read it in the sentence. Weeding the garden is backbreaking work. Yes, that makes sense. My game plan was to use peeling off, rhyming, and vowel alert, and I got the word backbreaking. Okay? That's a very, very brief description of the program, and be, I would be happy to speak to anybody about the program if you want to hear more about it. And again, that's just the decoding and spelling program that we're doing uh, with India at this time. Now, I mentioned earlier that we also have a professional development component to the program, and we feel that this is critical to the success of the program. Um, we provide teacher training workshops. So in India, for example, we have with each cohort of teachers, we're in our third cohort now, we provide um, four days for the first half of the program and then four days for the second half of the program. And those workshops provide instruction on reading development, uh, current research on reading disabilities, and evidence-based literacy training. And we provide, obviously, an overview of Empower Reading and get into the nuts and bolts of the Empower Reading program. And there are, it's very interactive and lots of uh, practice opportunities for the teachers. The second uh, bullet is critical, where we talk about on-site coaching visits or remote coaching visits. And whether our teachers are in Indonesia or India or around the corner, every teacher has an Empower Coach. And what we do is we watch the classes periodically. Well, first of all, we're there to answer any questions the teachers have. But we're also there to watch the classes periodically. Um, to support the teachers in delivering the program. We're not there to judge them as teachers, but to truly support them so that they can deliver the program as best as they possibly can. We may model lessons for them, and I, I've modeled classes uh, for my India teachers many times on Skype or, you know, on um, video conferencing platforms. Uh, we may watch classes, provide feedback. We're there to address concerns, questions, problem solving. We're also very much helping the teachers looking at the progress of the students and addressing any issues that may come up. And then we also have online support via our Empower website. 
So now I am going to hand it over to Dr. Kukulkani, who will just briefly talk about uh, the Morris Foundation and how this collaboration started. Thank you, Maria. Okay, so we are dot, and that's a good afternoon to you. <laughs> <laughs> At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Lee Siang for inviting us. And uh, it's very interesting. Um, a few months ago, I got a mail from um, Dyslexia Association of Singapore, whether I would like to participate as a speaker. And I just happened to send that mail to Maria. I said, Maria, this is an excellent opportunity for us to share our work, and uh, because uh, it's been a wonderful journey with sick kids uh, at uh, Toronto while they were implementing this Empower Reading program, which I'll just uh, speak later on. But before that, I would like to introduce my organization. So uh, this is the Dr. Anjali Morris Education and Health Foundation, and it was uh, Dr. Anjali Morris, who's a pediatrician uh, based in USA, and uh, she, from her personal funds, started this program in Pune. And uh, the work actually started in 2003 under the Bridging Over Learning Difficulties program, that's BOLD program. And uh, it started as a not-for-profit venture with very few kids and about a couple of schools. And then gradually, the uh, work uh, started expanding in Pune. And so in 2008, it was uh, formed into a, a not-for-profit company. And so this, this February, we have completed a decade working with children uh, struggling in academics. So uh, initially, the, we had few teachers and few children and some few outreach schools where we started this program. So I think from eight, uh, 2008 to 13, we had our struggle where we were trying to find routes and have some standardized practices. We did follow some, but more so it was an informal way which we were doing the program. In 2013, uh, we were joined by Dr. Shushma Nagarkar, who is a PhD in special education. She was instrumental in bringing about a huge change and the last five years, AMF has seen an exponential growth. So what do we do? We uh, actually could you just yeah. thanks. There you go. Yeah. So uh, we uh, do uh, assess the children. We identify. We do screening and identify children. And uh, we have ha have an half an hour introductory meeting with the parents to find out if actually the child is struggling because of uh, the skill deficit or it's a, a second language issue or it has some other disability or other comorbidity. And then if we are more or less sure that probably the child is struggling because of a skill deficit, then we seek permission from the parent and we do assessments. And then based on the evaluation report, if the di uh, difficulty is in reading, writing, math or all three, we offer uh, long term and short term goals and certain uh, interventions in reading, writing and math and uh, the child works with us for about a year and if still faces difficulty then these children are referred to government institute for certification and uh, uh, availing the accommodations provided by the government of India. And uh, so besides that uh, the assessments and the evidence based interventions we conduct training for teachers. So, uh, in the last three years, a shift, we have a policy shift, uh, uh, we had laid down a strategic plan and we realized that uh, there is such a huge need for children struggling in academics and uh, Morris Foundation alone can't reach out. So then we uh, sort of changed our strategy and re instead of reaching directly to them, we focused on teachers training program and uh, we curtailed our direct reach and then we went out to more and more schools and uh, we offered training to teachers, mainstream teachers and some uh, schools volunteer to replicate our program and then what we call the technically assisted projects, we s started those in a big way. Uh, so currently we have about nine projects going on and many of them have uh, 
have enrolled themselves for the Empower Reading program. And uh, that is how we started reaching in directly to the students. And uh, we have uh, four resource centers in Pune. We are working with uh, five outreach schools and as I said, nine technically assisted projects. And uh, we have done a lot of collaborations. One of them, of course, is with Sick Kids Toronto for the Empower Reading program. And uh, Morris Foundation has just uh, started, I would say it is in infancy stage, uh, the research where uh, we are developing uh, curriculum based measures in Marathi, that is our uh, local language of Maharashtra state, which is one of the state in India. So, we have uh, collaborated with Dr. Roland Good, who is um, from the University of Oregon, USA, and he is the author of uh, the um, curriculum based measure called DEBELS and he has developed this in other languages, Spanish, Latvian. So, he was uh, very excited when we approached him that would we develop uh, uh, this in Marathi and that is how the project has just started. We have completed a project with some amazing results. So, that is a multi year project which will go on. Now, I, I have very uh, something very interesting to share about the Empower Reading program. Uh, is this the next slide? Yeah. So, uh, in 2015, I uh, happened to visit, I, I participated in the, I was a delegate at the IDA conference in um, uh, Texas, uh, I mean to say uh, Dallas. And uh, one of uh, our directors who also happens to be the daughter of Dr. Anjali Morris, Anita Morris, she is located in uh, Toronto. So, she invited me, she said, why do not you just visit while on your way back to India, why do not you just visit us uh, in Toronto and let us see this, uh, there is this program called Empower Reading Program and why do not you come and visit. So, <coughs> after my conference, I visited Toronto and uh, Maria arranged some visits to uh, some uh, school boards, schools in Toronto and then I saw the program and to be very honest, I must confess when I saw this, I said this is not going to work in India. That was my first impression and I was so wrong and I am happy I was wrong mm -hmm. because uh, you know we just had a very casual talk, oh so nice to meet you, so nice to, this is a very nice program and okay and let us see if this works in India and we just walked off. But uh, when I came and this is <laughs> the reality and you know it is really such a, uh, I and Maria keep discussing this, this is such a surreal experience that after two years we are here collaborating and sharing our experience uh, with you all. So, uh, we are very fortunate for this. And uh, <coughs> so, when I came back, I just mentioned this to Shushma, who is our technical consultant. I said, you know, I visited this program. I am not very sure whether this will work, but let us explore. So, we contacted uh, Maria and they were kind enough to send the entire training material uh, <coughs> for us to study. So, when we studied it and we studied some other couple of other reading programs, we found this evidence based more um, practically oriented and we thought let us try. So, and the fact that the collaboration worked with the baseline that it is ok to fail, at the most this will not work. So, we said ok fine. So, we had volunteer parents, so 40, uh, I mean about 59 children enrolled into the program and 40 of them went on to complete the program of 110 lessons uh, in the next one year and the results were amazing. So, we did a pre-test and post-test and the best part was there was evidence to show that this program helped the children. So, in <coughs> the process, so Maria came in June 2016, trained 10 of uh, teachers from Anjali Morris Foundation. We implemented this program with those 40 children, I mean to the say 60 children, 40 went on to complete. We did the results and then um, we in 2017, we expanded this program to uh, the outreach schools and the technically assisted projects and Maria will share with you the results. So, um, <coughs> and now this is the third year and we have further expanded our program and we, we thought that this is the best platform to share this program with you because uh, of course, as I was talking to uh, Lee Siang, the whatever culture may be, whatever country we are, the problems remain the same. And 
I would like to also mention that the success of the program also depended depended on the trainer, hugely on the trainer, because Maria was so flexible, she uh, never judged our setup and uh, she identified with all the pro uh, problems we had right from the english proficiency of our teachers the children the setup the overcrowded classrooms and, uh, and she was okay with all and we started finding you know we there would be a problem and we would try and solve it there would be a problem and we'd look for a solution so i think it all worked very fine and i'm very hopeful that this will expand not only in india and other places so I think I'll hand over to Maria to explain the rest. Uh, keep, I, there's lots to share, so you can connect to me, but the time is the the very time less. Is picking. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You did a great job of explaining the partnership, and thank you. Uh, no, it's been a, a fabulous uh, collaboration, and so as as Uma was uh, briefly de you know, describing uh, how it worked, so I trained the initial 10 teachers. Uh, we saw... Um, there were 60 students, but 40 completed the program, and we can't uh, thank the parents enough for their commitment to the program. Um, so we're looking here at the students were in group sizes of one to six. We always recommend that the group sizes be somewhere between four and eight. Um, and we always recommend it's always best to try to group the students based on reading level. Um, most of the students actually were not diagnosed with a specific learning disorder. We suspect that some of them probably had a reading disability, dyslexia. Um, some of them perhaps were just from, uh, they, they were just lagging behind for whatever, maybe social cultural reasons, etc. La you know, uh, lack of opportunities. You'll see 27 males, 13 females in the first cohort. And in terms of the measures, uh, we administered a lot of standardized tests of word reading, nonsense word reading, like the Woodcock Johnson, the Tower, as well as some. Um, experimental measures of uh, taught to and untaught content or words that we've developed as the kids and we've been using for 30 plus years. We also did the WAPT, which assesses oral proficiency and literacy proficiency levels. And I really want you to note the kids came out extremely low. The, the majority of the kids had very, very limited English proficiency skills, both orally and in writing, and we thought, well, let's still try it. And a lot of the kids, their parents, you know, have very limited English speaking skills as well. With that first cohort, we saw, we were thrilled with the results. Now, we don't have a control condition, so we can't make claims like, you know, Empower automatically did this, and that is the next phase of our research. But certainly, we saw change. And so, if you look at these different tests, uh, you're looking at raw scores. You know, on the keyword test, kids went from reading 26 odd words to almost 40. On the test of transfer, 20 plus words to almost 50. And the challenge test from, what is it, you know, 17 words to almost 45. These two tests in particular are transfer tests. We intentionally do not teach the children the content in those tests. It requires the students to transfer their skills and apply the strategies. And so you can see the kinds of words they were reading at baseline compared to the kinds of words they were reading by the end of the program. Of course, we also have administered the Woodcock Johnson. And here you're seeing standard scores, the expected level being 90, an average reader. And so uh, the purple representing post-testing, the orange representing pre-testing. We have three different measures. And you're seeing that the kids were approaching or surpassed the average range in both word identification and word attack. Passage comprehension, there was a little bit of growth, but clearly not a substantial amount at this point. Now, we, we did do a second phase of the study or of this pilot project last year where we trained additional teachers in some other schools. And in total, we saw 138 students. We also have trained some of their teachers to be mentors under my supervision because we're also trying to build capacity in Pune. So now looking at the 175 students that we've seen, so the, again, here we have letter sounds and sound combinations that we teach the students. So we're seeing growth in these students and their knowledge of letter sounds and sound combinations. And as well, we're seeing growth on those same three measures. 
And so we're thrilled by these results because we expanded out to community schools, trying to train those teachers. And we definitely encountered challenges, which I'll briefly mention, but we still saw some good growth. So we're excited for the next phase where we can actually collect some data using um, you know, proper control conditions. Just because of time, I'm going to whip through the uh, these last couple of data slides. But again, please come in and speak with me if you're interested. So what are the implications? Well, definitely there was transfer of learning demonstrated on several of the tests. Improvements noted on several measures of reading and reading related skills, including for students with low English proficiency levels. And I also want to mention that several of the students who did very, very well uh, qualified for enrollment in private schools under the Right to Education Act. So these would be students who are come from very impoverished homes, but 25% of these private schools are, or 25% of the students in the private schools are required um, to be from, to be, uh, to qualify for the Right to Education Act. And also there's potential for generalizability for improving literacy skills of students at risk for literacy learning disorders in low and middle income um, countries where English is a main language of in instruction. So looking forward, I mean, there still are some challenges. And uh, you know, these are some of the challenges that we continue to face. And we realize some of them are huge challenges, and they're not going to be resolved overnight. But one of the things, so for example, teacher knowledge on literacy, reading disabilities, and LDs. This is something we certainly encountered last year. And so to tackle that challenge, you know, we made sure that in addition to the training in Empower, uh, the, um, the AMF uh, staff, they provided a six-day in-service to just talk to them about reading generally, reading disabilities, learning disabilities, to prep them for the Empower training. So that's one thing that was put into place. Greater communication with parents, um, just to sensitize them more to reading disabilities. Another challenge is, of course, the language proficiency skills of the teachers. And so for this next round of teachers, we tried to ask for teachers who perhaps had more adequate English language skills. Now again, we, we didn't uh, assess it formally, but just, just so that they would have a bit more knowledge of the English language to be able to implement the program. But it, you know, we, we, one of the things we approach it at Sick Kids is a collaboration truly. We don't want to come in and just say, no, you have to do it our way. Yes, there are certain things about the program we don't want modified because then you're affecting the quality of the program. But we also recognize that it's a collaboration and you have to be realistic about the surroundings and let's see how we can make it work. And so that's what we continue to do in this collaboration. Okay, sorry the bell went off. <laughs> so these are just additional considerations for future scaling up globally. We recognize that, you know, every different location that you go to will bring its own unique challenges and we recognize that it's important to work with those settings in a collaborative manner. We want to acknowledge uh, the great work that brings us here. Um, Dr. Maureen Lovett is the director of our program and it's her many, it's her vision and many years of research that's brought Empower to where it is. Uh, Dr. Anita Morris is the director uh, of the board and we'd like to thank all of the board of directors at the AMF for supporting this collaboration and of course all the wonderful teachers at the AMF and our parents and children. And this is one of my favorite stories. This is Zed and his mother. And Zed is just the most adorable student. So before joining AMF, Zed had difficulty and less interest in reading and writing. He could not do phonics, blending words, diagraphs, faced bullying by peers in his class and was isolated most of the year. And I remember when we're talking about how he'd barely answer questions when she'd ask him questions. He'd just smile and you know, just really didn't have confidence, whereas now he barges into her office very confidently and asks questions and makes statements. But he himself has said how the program has really made a difference for him. It's, he's, he's a much better reader, uh, writes small passages, and remarkable improvement. So we're really thrilled with stories like this because at the end of the day, it's all about each individual student. Anyway, thank you all very much. And just, um, 
I'd just like to end. There is a child who was enrolled in Empower and he goes home and teaches his mother how to speak. And that's really, really um, encouraging. And uh, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity.